would love if I could as well. Yeah, it's a share recording. You can download oh. it in the chat. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Thank uh -huh. you so much. Uh -huh. um, I'm so impressed by what you've been doing um, this chunk of time and mm -hmm. uh, really, really excited to speak with you. I mm -hmm. got to hear you speak in Berlin. Uh -huh. um, and um, yeah, I've been looking forward to this. Thank you so much. Sure. So um, I'm uh, working on um, a few things, but one of the things I've been doing is with the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin. And um, I think uh, Europeans and Americans both have uh, so much that we want to be learning from you. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd, I'd love your take first on um, just, I guess, how, how that's been, uh, the, you know, sharing your learnings with the international realm. Mm -hmm. um, has that been, uh, you know, mm -hmm. first, you know, how, wh what has that been like in terms of sharing those best practices? You know, I, I remember during your time in Berlin, someone asked, uh, you know, it was, it was it was for me so interesting to see how many Germans responded and said, oh, we can't do what you did in Germany. Mm -hmm. And the whole time I was thinking, why not? No, <laughs> And, and now what <laughs> you're, you're actually now doing some of these measures uh, that we are doing. Um, and so I think uh, this is a game changer, uh, whereas people feel digitization or social innovation is a kind of on a different time scale of urgency, just like climate change, you know, every jurisdiction view is a different urgency. Coronavirus brought international collaboration into a new uh, table of urgency. So just a, a few days before the World Health Assembly, we held a virtual forum. It's a 14 uh, nations uh, mini lateral, um, and mm -hmm. uh, it would work perfectly. And uh, people mm -hmm. really That's enjoyed right. changes and so on. And so that, uh, I think, brought Taiwan's experience, what we are now calling Taiwan model, uh, I think, to a level where uh, we can share with people this entire package of social innovation, not just bits and pieces, because uh, every epicenter is just two months before, or two months after each other epicenter. And so there's much more um, that uh, hold us in common. Uh, whereas when we talk about disinformation or climate change or other topics, um, uh, not every jurisdiction feel uh, the same way when it comes to the urgency. So this is uh, the general feeling that I'm having these days. Yeah, so it's, um, you, you'd say the, uh, well, I guess what, what then do you think can m most effectively be shared from what you've mm -hmm. learned uh, yeah, sure. that you've seen? Mm -hmm. Right, so, so I just gave a uh, video conference to the Asia Pacific Foundation of mm -hmm. Canada uh, and the uh, idea of humor over rumor. Uh, our counter disinformation playbook um, is uh, the kind of one takeaway that many people came uh, away very interested in because in Taiwan we don't have uh, any lockdown uh, and we don't have a lockdown on online speech, right? There's no censorship, there's no takedown uh, possible from the government. So we um, look at how uh, conspiracy theories spread and we see the factors that contribute to their basic transmission rate, basically analyze it as a epidemiologist uh, would analyze a um, human to human transmission uh, of biological virus. Uh, we see it as a kind of mimetic or ideological virus. Uh, and so we saw that a sense of outrage um, is the main determining factor. And that can be very easily uh, countered and vaccinated using the power of humor. Um, and so we shared many uh, cases uh, where um, we shared, for example, there was a tissue paper panic buying. Um, and when people panic by tissue papers, they that's because they believe a rumor that says that it's made out of the same material as the facial mask, which we are ramping up production from uh, less than 2 million to 20 million a day. And so obviously people will want to hoard the mask if they believe the sense of outrage that the government is repurposing tissue papers to manufacture masks. But uh, that died down within just a couple of days because within two hours, uh, our premier, uh, who you can look at, can you see my screen? Yeah, so this is our prime minister, our premier. Uh, he wrote this out on his social media, uh, showing his Botox and uh, w uh, wiggling it a little bit uh, and saying, we only have one pair of Botox each, uh, and meaning that it doesn't make sense to hold tissue papers. Uh, and there is a table here that says, the tissue paper came from South American material, um, and this uh, mas medical mask came from Taiwanese domestic material. So there's no way that these two can interfere with one another. And, and so the payload is, of course, just standard clarification material that is packaged literally with a tissue paper packaging. Uh, th this is what a tissue paper package looks like. Uh, and so this went absolutely viral. Yeah. And, 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 you, and you laughed about it, meaning that the next time you see the conspiracy theory, you will not spread it because you've been vaccinated. The same psychological mm -hmm. motivation 
that turns upset to outrage has been repurposed into humor. And this is good humor because he makes fun of himself, not anybody else. And so this idea of humor over rumor, I think, is one of the things in the Taiwan model of countering disinformation that everybody can just easily um, apply to their communication strategy. And if they respond within two hours, this kind of viral memes that are designed to inoculate uh, disinformation will no longer uh, be a, such a large problem uh, during the pandemic. That's that's brilliant. And, and um, you know, uh, so so. One of the one of the challenges with disinformation is once it once it starts once you see it uh, the first time um, even if it gets corrected right you you hang on to if you already agreed with the disinformation or the general um, message of the disinformation um, it's hard to uh, it, it's hard to inoculate post right do you feel like um, you mm -hmm. found yeah, ways which is to why responding uh, within two hours is so important right. uh, because the vaccination mm -hmm. doesn't work as a cure, right? It, it, it's, it's a different thing. Uh, and when you already uh, believe in something else, then of course it's harder uh, to correct the message afterward. But we do that uh, still using uh, daily press conferences. Every day uh, there's a live press conference where the journalist and indeed anyone can pick up their phone and uh, spread uh, whatever uh, their um, conspiracy theories uh, at the Central Epidemic Control Center and they will develop a counter response. For example, um, there was one day in April uh, where um, there's a, uh, because we do mass rationing, uh, there's a uh, district, I think, that only get pink medical mask as their supply. Uh, and uh, there was a boy that refused to go to school because he doesn't want to wear a pink medical mask, saying that their uh, schoolmates will laugh at him. Uh, and and the, the people uh, were, of course, responding to it uh, by encouraging him and so on. And, but that doesn't quite work because he just thinks he will get bullied uh, for wearing a pink medical mask. And so this is a post response, right? So um, so a day after this happened and the uh, 1922 hotline received this um, message, this is our counter response a day after, not two hours. Everybody uh, in the Central Epidemic Command Center, including the minister, start wearing pink medical masks. Uh, and, and everybody, uh, you know, uh, changed their Facebook posts, uh, avatar or whatever, pink. Uh, saying that gender mainstreaming, which is a you know social innovation, um, is also to be shared uh, in a way that changes people's associations. So basically, it's not a, a counter message saying that you know it's wrong to discriminate against pink, pink mask uh, wearer. Uh, rather, this is a kind of performance art uh, where the entire CCC just start wearing pink, uh, and so redefining, reassociating uh, this message. And and this is also seen in many other uh, you know memes. Like after each press conference, there's a spokes dog of the uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare that translates uh, social distancing rules, uh, you know, um, covering your mouth, um, washing your hands, pre-order your mask into very cute memes, which uh, still get into the cognitive space post a disinformation, even if uh, the conspiracy theory has already spread, because a human to human mm -hmm. transmission is not as viral as a cute dog to human transmission. With this dog example, uh, what was the process of coming up with it? Do you uh -huh. do you have a you know is it a gut instinct? Is it do you A/B uh, test? It's images? A, it's a process. Yes, yeah, a process. So uh, we have a team called participation officers in each ministry, whose uh, whole work is to work with people uh, who feedback their social innovations through e-petitions or uh, sandboxes or whatever uh, platforms that we're using online. So this is basically an online engagement specialty, uh, and uh, they uh, work with professional comedians. Uh, on such things, so this is a process. And in this particular case, the PO of the Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, literally lived with that dog. Uh, and so, um, and their home is like a uh, 10 minutes walk from the Ministry of Health and Welfare. So anytime they need a new picture, instead of paying Shutterstock or something like that, they just go home and take a new picture of the new post of the dog. Uh, and so this is uh, basically what people would do on Instagram, right? If they want to garner a lot of followers, they just post a lot of cute cat or dog pictures and, and their uh, living experience with them. It's just that they imbue each such new picture with a new public health announcement uh, message. Uh, and so this is a mimetic delivery. Uh, and it was, uh, of course, uh, not that easy to get everybody to accept that. But uh, after the uh, uh, loss of the local election uh, by um, by many considered as a you know conspiracy theory taking interference uh, into national referenda and elections uh, for the past um, 
year uh, and a half, uh, we have been perfecting this art of uh, what we call humor over rumor, uh, which uh, at the first first line response vaccinates, and then we cure using even stronger, uh, you know, association materials that relies on cute dogs and, um, you know pink medical mask, uh, things that breaks out of people's uh, original uh, us versus them habits, but rather include all the different signs. Yes, yes and, and um, like rumor, humor is so context specific, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, what Taiwanese people find funny or cute mm -hmm. might not be true for Americans, so we couldn't just copy the dog, right? But uh -huh. I think, um, but, uh, but there's, there's something very powerful at the macro level of humor over rumor, I guess, what other pieces of this participatory process that you're speaking of, how would you distill that down into something that um, other other mm -hmm. other communities can mm -hmm. can copy? Right. So uh, the the three keywords are fast, fair, fun. Right. So um, fast means that you iterate. You you cannot start perfect. So the the basic thing is that you uh, have a hotline where people can tell you what you got wrong. Uh, and everybody can just call, as I said, 1922 and tell the CECC uh, what to do, essentially. And so it remains a bi-directional uh, communication where everybody can very easily, even for the people who are not digitally uh, so savvy um, to type their ideas, they can just pick up their phone and share their ideas. And we have uh, a, a large call center that just distill uh, such crowd innovation into the daily press conference. It's almost like a ritual uh, where everybody <clears throat> views if they have the time uh, or uh, at least look at the sign language uh, interpreter <laughs> if they don't have uh, the audio bandwidth. If they have neither bandwidth, of course, they wait for the dog picture afterward. So that's the fast part. So just keep iterating until you get it uh, perfect. And then the fair part, which it means that everybody can look at the hard data so the mimetic uh, picture uh, doesn't work unless you have the um, data to back that those tables up, right? So, and the data <clears throat> is participatory, meaning that when we say there's uh, no shortage of mask, we don't uh, say it in a top-down manner. We say we publish the real-time stock level of all pharmacies every 30 seconds at that time, now every three minutes. So everybody can walk to a nearby pharmacy, use their national health card to get nine medical mask if you're a adult or 10 if you're a child every two weeks and see the stock level of that pharmacy deplete by nine or 10 after a couple of minutes on your phone using more than 100 tools, including chatbots. And these are all created by the social sector. So the whole point of trusting citizens with real-time open data is that people can hold each other accountable. And then people can do analysis that tells us where did we get wrong, like an oversupply or undersupply, uh, and uh, tell us to work with uh, people who uh, work uh, long hours who cannot collect the uh, mass from pharmacies because they would uh, close for business uh, during that late at night. We work with convenience stores and on, a, uh, on those uh, pre-ordering system. So the fair part ensures that we are inclusive and people who are left off uh, have a way to work with civic technologists to inform each other and also tell the government what to do. And of course, we are already um, do the fun part. So uh, fast and fair, I think, is the building blocks that enable the fun. The fun by itself doesn't yeah. work unless you have a fast iteration and you have a fair allocation uh, and trusting citizens with open data. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned this participatory uh, role of citizens, right? And I'm curious how you make sure that it's not just the most extreme voices like mm -hmm. on an Amazon review, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to be the ones who participate? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, a, a call to 1922 uh, doesn't um, preclude anybody else from calling. We just keep expanding the call center. Uh, and so it's not a limited attention resource as you would on a uh, online platform with the reply button, which would be people you know, uh, attacking each other's face, not each other's book, right? Uh, and so that makes uh, more sense, I guess, to build a online space uh, powered by reply-free technologies such as Polis and Slido uh, and the joint platform of e-petition where you can have your pro and con arguments, but you cannot reply to each other. And that kind of automatically build a pro-social environment rather than an anti-social environment. And of course, uh, the, the good old telephone uh, is still the best because there is no way to upvote or downvote uh, or reply to each other if you're making calls to 1922. Uh, so we use uh, plenty of spaces for that. Uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, also more creative uh, 
aspects of, of it. For example, the Cohack, the coronavirus hackathon, uh, where um, it's in uh, cohack.tw, uh, and everybody can look at what other people uh, have in mind. Uh, I'll switch to the English part. Um, have in mind, for example, for uh, these countries and these people uh, who responded to uh, the call for uh, open source solutions, they get the, the winning prize is an electric um, rice cooker uh, that you can use to disinfect your mask. I made a video uh, on that. And so on those themes, manage community resource, make smooth transition to a new world, protecting vulnerable groups, protecting uh, future pandemics, supporting frontline staff, and establish data-driven uh, risk communication. We use the police technology where anyone can submit their ideas and upload and download, but they cannot um, reply to each other. And so then we look at those different extreme voices, and you will see that for this particular topic, um, group B is 22 people, and group A is 63 people but the area measures diversity. It does not measure the number of people. So, so this area is not three times larger uh, than the group B. So even if you mobilize like 5,000 extreme people vote exactly the same way, it will not increase the area here by, by any bit, right? Um, and so um, basically group A and B differ uh, on uh, a very fine-grained uh, travel history for confirmed cases. This is a privacy thing. Uh, so, because they don't manage to convince each other, this doesn't become the co-hack topic. But they do agree uh, on, for example, the logistics map, like the mask map, the availability of not just masks, but uh, alcohol hand sprays um, and things like that. And these are like digital transformation for Miss Mies, um and things like that are uh, very interesting uh, and they all agree on that. So we only choose the topics that has broad agreement across all the diverse groups as uh, the binding agenda for the co-hack um, hackathon. And this is important because mm -hmm. we then make sure that the extreme voices do not dominate. They have to uh, do more uh, nuanced um, conversations and repost their statements in a way that can appeal to the other sides of the aisles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I get asked, uh, and I think a lot of people wonder why Taiwan has done so well um, in, in handling COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and fun, fast, fat, fast, fun, fair, fun is uh, seems to be, and humor over mm -hmm. rumor seems to be a, a part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. What other mm -hmm. reasons uh, would you, and explanations would you give? Mm -hmm. Also, I think this uh, mask culture, uh, where we uh, build a mask, is not something that protects others, but something that protects yourself, and it protects yourself by reminding you to not touch your face uh, with unwashed hands. It's a self reminder to wash your hands properly and not touch your face, and, and that that's it. Uh, and so this is a, a um, interesting strategy. Instead of a, a being collectivist, which would be you know uh, we order everybody to wear a mask, otherwise you uh, put a fine or keep social distance, physical distance. Uh, otherwise you we put a fine. We, we never impose any fine for uh, physical distancing or mask wearing. This is just a norm building and the appeal to people's self protect protection nature. And if you're in a large uh, crowd gathering of 50 people and you cannot keep the physical distance, the few people who wear the mask can remind other people to take care of themselves, which is a very natural thing to do, rather than asking they, them to protect uh, you, to respect you, which is a very difficult thing to do if you're in the minority. Uh, and so uh, we also make this mimetic uh, in a sense of that it's easy to share this idea of protecting your, from your own hands uh, and remind yourself to wash your hands, which is what's required to make medical mask work anyway. Uh, and so this is, again, one of the reasons why uh, we have a mask wearing culture so quick um, after the um, epidemic has uh, uh, happened and that we do not actually have to teach people how to properly wear the mask because they remind each other very easily and, and also uh, the nursery rhymes and things like that on mm -hmm. how to wear the mask properly and all that. In this norm building, right, is, um, one, you know, one critique uh, is that it's only possible in relatively homogenous societies mm -hmm. uh, to do so quickly. As you've been working with other communities around the world, and um, have you seen that mm -hmm. cultures that are, or, or societies that are more diverse mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. are able to 
do uh, what what you advise in, in well, the same I, I'm not sure about this homogeneous thing because we have 20 or more national languages, uh, including sign languages. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't say Taiwanese people are a homogeneous bunch. Uh, but I think you can say that we're, we're very populous, right? 23 million people, but from Taipei to Kaohsiung through high speed rails, only 95 seconds, uh, sorry, minutes. <coughs> So the population density, which is much higher in Taiwan, I guess is uh, both good for norm building because there's more social examples to, to look at, but also harder from an epidemiology standpoint uh, because it's much easier for virus to spread, just like it's easier for idea to spread. So the high density is, um, is double-edged, I guess. But I, I wouldn't say that this is homogeneous at all. I would say that we work on a norm that appeals uh, to the common human nature of, of enjoy humorous um, messages of uh, liking cute dogs and cute cats uh, and of uh, self-protection and taking care of your family uh, and things like that. So we are working on more universal message when we don't have the top-down lockdown or other top-down um, emergency order or whatever constitutional uh, powers. We never declare an emergency situation. So we have to um, you know, realize this kind of coronavirus strategy by essentially a co-learning culture, by making everybody a fellow epidemiologist uh, amateurly. Uh, and so our vice president at that time uh, recorded this whole online course um, that uh, teaches uh, epidemiology 101 uh, to lay audience. Uh, and, um, and you can see here at Taiwan Can Help that us, who can help Taiwan. Uh, and if you scroll down a little bit, you will see uh, the crash course. Um, and recorded by VP Chen Jianren, uh, and uh, actually the epidemiologist, not only a vice president at the time, but he literally wrote a textbook on epidemiology, an academician. Uh, and so he is uh, both a political Hi, and uh, health authority. And he explains the Arnold value, wear a mask, washing your hands, how the dynamic work, how quarantining works, policy for testing, and so on, in a very easy to understand uh, manner, uh, and treating essentially everybody as adults. Uh, as fellow uh, practitioners of epidemiology. And this is as opposed to uh, this idea of, um, you know, people need to be kept in the dark, are obedient, Confucian, collectivist, or, or things like that. This is treating everybody as adults and making sure that people understand the why of each uh, policy measures. Yes, with content like this, uh, one, one challenge is getting people to actually watch the whole thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and pay attention. How do you think mm -hmm. that piece through? Uh, professional YouTubers. Uh, the the YouTubers, they, they participated. They literally crowdfunded this website. This is not a government website. This is just a crowdfunding campaign uh, and, and bought down by, you know, the, the leading YouTubers. And they all took quizzes. Um, and test each other's knowledge about epidemiology and found that there's uh, um, sense of, uh, you know, we don't know the essential uh, science uh, behind what we're doing. Uh, and then uh, they promoted this film on a the leading uh, massive online course um, platform, the Ha Hao. So uh, within a few days, more than 20,000 people enrolled. Uh, and then they taught their friends and families. So I'm one of the people who enrolled. That's, um, that's amazing. I, I, I'm also curious how you make sense of communities outside of your direct authority, right? I, excuse me, let me, let me re rephrase that. I, I guess I mean, you know, Taiwan is able to keep the numbers for, the, for COVID down, mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, it's one place in, mm -hmm. in, a, in a broader world where um, others are not following the same norms or well, uh, the same regulations. regulations are, right? Uh, uh, Prime Minister Ardern said, You're, we're pretty much doing whatever Taiwan is doing, right? Uh, and, and they're also doing quite well. Um, and, okay. and so, so yeah, the Taiwan Can Help That Us website is a distilled version of the Taiwan model that we're happy to share to other jurisdictions. Uh, and if people do not want to listen to the crash course uh, offered by our president, uh, we, uh, sorry, vice president, um, we, we also share this, uh, what happens next. Uh, it's a really good interactive uh, game that you can just, uh, just like watching a comic. Uh, learn epidemiology and learn the uh, SIR model. You can even experience uh, with the 
lockdown scenario, how contact tracing works, and things like that, uh, and see how those um, herd immunity, ICU capacity, and things like that, uh, and how that uh, can successfully counter the coronavirus uh, just by proper use of mask and things like that. And so uh, there's, of course, also a local trans translation uh, of that. I think it's been translated to many, many languages. And if you're interested in helping uh, it to translate to other languages, um, that, that's great. There's also a German uh, language on that. So I think that's the content that we can not only contribute. Uh, well, it does say Taiwan here. Warte mal, haben Taiwan und Südkorea nicht bereits in der Griff gekommen. Right. So, uh, and, and that is, um, I think, important to provide the raw material, the open data, so that the people who specialize in digital storytelling um, can then make such interactive storytelling pieces based on the data that we provide. And what about the collection of data? Mm -hmm. How do you ensure privacy or... Um, we don't how, collect you know, extra data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there's no, so, there's no Bluetooth app or anything like that. Um, why do you think everyone else is so obsessed with data collection as, as the main focal point of, of the response? Well, I think that's because in Taiwan, uh, we had to work uh, with the constitutional limit. We don't have an emergency situation. So everything we do need to be pre-approved by the legislation. So we're bound by the Personal Data uh, uh, Protection Act. So our solution space is already very constrained to begin with. Uh, this is much like our counter disinformation strategy. We have to innovate on humor over rumor because there is no constitutional um, authorization for us to take down any content uh, on the social media. So we have to, to innovate in a way that doesn't uh, overextend the administrative powers. Um, but I think this is a, a great opportunity for the social sector to jointly control its data collection, to care about their own health records uh, to each other. Uh, indeed, the COHAC winners are all about uh, you know, um, making a record of your personal visits and things like that, your temperature, but not sharing it to the public or to the state or any company, but just uh, among the people who care about you, like your immediate family and things like that. And when a contact tracer do come to you, there is a uh, one-time URL that you can share with them that only talks in professional contact tracing terms, so that you will not accidentally reveal the private information uh, of your other uh, friends and families that you have contact with. So getting contact tracers, the information they need without compromising privacy. This is called privacy enhancing technology, or PET, and this is um, very hip uh, in Taiwan. Uh, so I think the other jurisdictions, uh, they may focus on data collection because they do want to extend their power, uh, even uh, for state surveillance like um, sharing the data uh, all to a trusted uh, party, <laughs> uh, sorry, the, the ruling party. Uh, that, is one, uh, that is one part. Of course, uh, people also sometimes trust uh, private sector or multinational companies and so on. So this is essentially a, a norm-shaping moment, whether the data is to be collected by the civil society and only by people who care about uh, each other and know each other, or by a, a one kind of state apparatus surveillance or by the multinational capitalist um, entities. Uh, this is uh, what we are deciding now will shape the culture uh, after the coronavirus. And so I think that's why everybody is so obsessed with this because this is a, a non-defining moment. Um, and I guess what I, um, are you saying that then the data collection if, if you shape the social norms properly, right, that mm -hmm. the data itself is not as integral, or are you saying that the data collection from as a, as a grassroots effort where yeah. it's, yeah, it's that, spread that's out is, is the, yeah. okay. This is uh, basically instead of data literacy or media literacy, which is people as consumers uh, of media uh, and uh, passive, um, you know, objects of data collection, we are instead of saying that we need to have digital competence, which means people are producers of media, uh, amateur journalists, and also curators of data, data contributors. And when people voluntarily curate their data, of course, they only want to share it in a way that are pro-social and that makes sense to their friends and families. And this is what I call the uh, social sector norm building. Uh, and I think this is a superior model um, to both the state surveillance model and the capitalist model. What is a challenge that you're currently uh, working on? 
um, this travel bubble um, thing, <laughs> how to uh, make sure that we trust each other's numbers, for example, between Taiwan and New Zealand, uh, in both mm -hmm. testing before and after landing a flight, uh, and that we can uh, relax uh, the physical distancing or large crowd gathering rules domestically while still allowing for limited uh, international travel. This is hard to balance. I mean, if we only allow for returning um, citizens in Taiwan, then of course, with the current border control and the quarantine, uh, we're reasonably sure we've been like 40 days with no local confirmed cases now. It's very safe. Taiwan's very safe now. Um, so we can remain that safe. However, we also want to resume international travel with other economies um, that have also countered the coronavirus and that uh, create additional risk both sides. So we have to do risk communication and uh, also norm building. Like if I wear a mask to New Zealand, I want to land in New Zealand still wearing this mask. <laughs> right? Uh, and, and so uh, making sure that this is properly communicated uh, is a challenge because then it entails um, a uh, kind of mini lateral agreement on many things. May I ask what you're reading these days? Uh, well, I am cautiously optimistic uh, that uh, we have a sufficient um, interest. Uh, as I said, the 14 um, economies uh, pre WHA uh, minilateral, um, I think people are very enthusiastic on resuming uh, some business travel. And uh, I, I have to ask what your take is on. Sure. And global politics with WHO mm -hmm. and uh, you know the this the role of Taiwan in 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 uh, in the WHO's work broadly. Sure. So uh, I think this is uh, absolutely to other uh, WHO members' detriment that the Taiwan contributions, especially very early on, uh, is not. Um, being spread to the uh, ministerial level. I mean, we had limited scientific community access in the WHO um, system, but uh, unless the other countries uh, vice president happen to be their lead epidemiologist. Um, otherwise, having scientific access is not the same as having political access, obviously. You can have the best scientific access, uh, but uh, those scientists still doesn't necessarily translate those measures into actionable political action. And that's why the ministerial access is so important. And so, of course, we're building our own unilateral conversations through uh, these forums and these global cooperation and training frameworks with the uh, Japan and US and so on, uh, but we uh, think this, um, I'm personally feeling that sad that we did not have the chance of getting the Ministry of Access very early on during January. And when you're choosing staff in particular, I'm curious what traits you look for in people that you find most attractive mm -hmm. in this work. Sure. So um, we basically recruit uh, people who can add a perspective. Uh, to a cross uh, interdisciplinary uh, work. Uh, and so from each ministry, uh, if they're a career public servant, we only have one person uh, at a time. So meaning that, uh, for example, the foreign service, uh, they have easily more than a dozen people want to join in my office. But if they all join, we become a section of the foreign service, right? So um, it, it has to offer um, a, a unique perspective, that's first. And also, although they still report to their uh, like foreign service minister, um, they need to give, to share as much as they take, at least. That is to say they must be willing to work out loud, not only to work uh, with other people's best practices, but also contribute their own best practices for other um, people who are uh, deployed from their ministries. So for example, when the Minister of Culture uh, discovered that uh, if you award uh, people afterward, instead of doing re uh, reimbursements like KPI uh, matching things, it massively simplified the incentive structure. And they share that in the Minister of Education um, um, this, this, this design uh, designated uh, employee here, uh, staff here, uh, then learns about this and then can influence the Ministry of uh, ed Education to choose this new method as an alternative to procurement. Uh, and so all these innovations just spread very easily if you want to uh, share as much as you want to take uh, from other people's sharing. So these two are the HR criteria. And how can others, we've been talking about how Taiwan can help other communities. How, how can others help Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, spread the message of the Taiwan model. Uh, Taiwan can help than us. Uh, and spread a hashtag, Taiwan can help, and Taiwan is helping. Uh, and so then build epicenter to epicenter relationships 
we're all very happy to work on, for example, um, privacy enhancing technologies uh, through the Cohack and many other um, endeavors. And so, yeah, just just you know, follow us on Twitter, I guess. And I, you know, on that point, when you talk about this work you mostly are mentioning technologies that already exist, right? Um, and I'm wondering how much of the work requires new technological innovation and how much of it is really just utilizing technologies that exist in new ways. Yeah, uh, well, because uh, we are very agile, meaning that we have to come up with responses to the societal expectations literally every day or at least every week, uh, we do not have time uh, for uh, you know very long incubation periods uh, when it comes to uh, research and science. Of course, the medical research is going on uh, with rapid test vaccines and, and drugs. These are new technologies, obviously. Uh, but on the digital side, we mostly just... Um, um, reappropriate uh, appropriate technologies uh, as we see a fit instead of uh, doing any uh, new novel uh, applications. But we do shorten the iteration cycle a lot. So like on the traditional open data platform, which data is published usually every day at maximum, uh, we change it to publish every 30 seconds to in enable distributed ledger like um, accountability framework. And that's new, but this is just a new interval of a existing technology. It's a new uh, application uh, uh, frame rate, I guess. Uh, but otherwise, uh, there's nothing new here. Thank you so much. If, if you have any closing words that I uh, could share also in this. Uh, yeah, sure, super. sure. I think the, the government should trust its citizens. The more you trust your citizens, uh, the more the citizens will be able to innovate and uh, let you know what's really going on and, and what you do. And to give no trust is to get no trust. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you so much. I, um, I really appreciate it. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.